London, England. A vibrant financial centre where steel and glass palaces rise from the banks of the River Thames, which winds through the bustling capital city that eight million people call home. London Tower Block. We'll speak to our reporter live at the scene. The London Fire Brigade right now are dealing with a serious fire in a tower block, Grenfell Tower, 23 storey residential block flats in Kensington. On the 14th of June 2017, just before 1 am, a fire broke out inside apartment 16 on the fourth floor of a 23 storey high rise tower block in West London known as the Grenfell Tower. Within 20 minutes, the whole building was ablaze. The building materials and cladding used in a controversial renovation burnt like a match. 72 people died in the catastrophe. We're stuck on the 23rd floor! Hello! When I saw the fire, I said, you know, bloody hell, now the fire is, you know, uh, you know, that's when, you know, I got a bit, you know, a bit more nervous. The cladding system on Grenfell was such that once that, once it had caught fire, that building was going to go up, I think, like a tinderbox. But that didn't mean that the people in it had to die. The Grenfell Tower fire was the worst peacetime residential fire in London for a hundred years. An extraordinary number of events led to the disaster and subsequent high death toll. A public inquiry is underway and much has been revealed about the dynamics of what went wrong that night. And yet hundreds of buildings are still at risk of a similar fire wherever private interests eat away at social housing to maximize profits at the cost of lives. Yeah, hello, hi, in the fire, flat 16 Greenfield Tower. So we have fire where? Flat 16 Greenfield Tower. Within six minutes of the call from the Ethiopian-born taxi driver in whose flat the fire began, the first responders were on the scene at the Grenfell Tower residential block in the London borough of Kensington and Chelsea. They thought they had put out the fire, but, as these thermal images show, burning material was dripping from the cladding panel outside the window. To the surprise of the firemen on scene, the fire swept upwards from flat 16 to the roof of the tower in a mere 20 minutes, trapping hundreds of people in this remodeled relic of the 1970s. Antonio Roncolato was in his flat on the 10th floor when he was awoken at about 1.30 a.m. by a text from his son. At around 1.40, Christopher, my son, came back from his work. After he finished work, he went for a couple of drinks and then he came back by car, by, um, by minicab. So, and on the way back, he got a phone call from one of his cousins telling him that uh, Grenfell Tower is burning. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, the Grenfell Tower was ablaze, and um, and he could not. He said, "What are you talking about?" So basically, he reached the the, the, the foot of Grenfell Tower, and straight away he called me and he told me, um, "Father, get out of there because the tower is burning." And um, basically, I was um, I was asleep. I was deep asleep, and I um, so I answered the phone and I said, "What are you talking about, Christopher?" <laughs> More firemen rushed to the scene and began attacking the fire from the outside. But after initially spreading vertically on the east face to the roof, it then spread horizontally when the cladding lining on the crown architectural detail burned and melted down around the top of the building, allowing fire to then start spreading downward on the other three faces as well. A few minutes after Christopher 
sent me a photo and I've got on my phone. And uh, he said, you see, I, I sent you a photo, did you see it? The tower is really burning. So, and the tower at that stage, 140, 145, was already, um, the, the east side of the tower was already, the, the left east side of the tower was already ablaze all the way up to the last floor. The apartments filled with dark, toxic smoke as flames crept in through vents and cracks in the window framing. Later, fire roared into the apartments after the heat of the blaze simply burst through windows. I got ready, I, um, I um, dressed up, I um, uh, put together my, um, some important documents, uh, my phone, laptop in a rucksack in order to say, oh, now I'm going out. You know, so and I put a, a cap and everything. So I, uh, let, uh, then I said, okay, let me assess. You know what the situation is like uh, in in the, in the stairway, in in the hallway. You know, so I touched my my front door, and it was very warm. And as I opened, um, a lot of um, I could see nothing. It was totally pitch pitch black. The smoke that the puff, the big puff of smoke that came in was so strong that made me. Closed the door straight away. It was very hot, very um, strong. It was like uh, if you're hit by a, a gas that you, you cannot breathe anymore. Go! 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 On the other side of the building, many residents still had no idea of the disaster unfolding. When they found out, many chose to follow the fire brigade's protocol and stayed put, as emergency dispatchers instructed them and as notices posted on each floor advised. So Christopher kept on calling me and, um, and then he passed me on to the fire marshal. And, he, you know, and, and I said, look, I'm on the 10th floor. I explained to, to them where I was located. And I said, I'm on the 10th floor. I cannot go outside. It's very dangerous. There is a lot of smoke. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's almost impossible. So I need, I need help to get out of here. I said, OK, mate, stay put, stay put. We know you're there. Somebody's coming to get you. Two hundred and fifty firemen were deployed during the emergency. What greeted them was nothing they had ever seen. More was going wrong than they could handle in one night. At one stage, around 2.30, around 2 it was still very dark outside, I realized that there is smoke coming in from the ledges of the windows, brand new windows just installed a year before, a year and a half before. So basically I could see puffs of smoke coming in and when I saw it I could not believe it and I said my god what is going on? There should be no smoke coming in, there should be no air, it should be airtight this place and it wasn't. So I went to the bathroom, I went to the, uh, I, I grabbed um, um, clothes, uh, towels and, and bed linen, whatever I had, I went to the bathroom and I put everything in the bathtub, make everything wet. And when I, because I wanted to put around the, the, the window ledges in order to stop the smoke from coming in. But when I came back, the, the flat was, um, the, the, the living room especially, was totally filled up with gray smoke. Over the next six hours, the inferno killed 72 people, some of London's most vulnerable citizens victims of dozens of failures in Britain's social housing policies and of a political class that ignored dire warnings of catastrophe on the horizon. The fire in apartment 16 on the fourth floor on the eastern side of Grenfell Tower spread to the outside, and within 20 minutes, the flames had reached the 23rd floor. And were burning and melting the cladded architectural crown detail installed during renovation to make it look more attractive. Today, the blackened, hollow shell of Grenfell Tower is masked in white plastic sheeting, a grim monument to decades of urban planning failures. The Grenfell Tower stands in the northwest corner of the Kensington and Chelsea borough of London, on the Lancaster West estate. 
It was owned by the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, the richest in England, but was managed by the privately owned Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation, or KCTMO. In this highly priced West London borough, the average selling price of a home is nearly a million pounds. These subsidised dwellings stood on some of the most prized land in the UK. They were home to a happy, multi-ethnic community of families and professionals. Right next to Grenfell Tower, we would have no major big buildings in there. So basically, the view that you would have from there, you know, it would be totally free and totally, you know, beautiful. My flat uh, was facing east and south, so basically I could see the city from my flat and on a clear uh, uh, day like today, you know, you could see, really see very, very far away. Bramley House is the closest residential building to Grenfell Tower just across the railway line. It is home to Samia Badani, co-chair of the North Kensington Community Association. I remember vividly a former resident of Grenfell Tower was at work. My daughter was in a playground because at the bottom of, of uh, Grenfell Tower there was a playground and we were all, all our children went to that Grenfell uh, playground. And my daughter was with her and her daughter and my daughter fell and then I got a call from her, I didn't know because my daughter was late, and she told me, don't worry, don't worry, she's like my daughter, I'm looking after her. It was that sense of um, human warmth, and these were the residents of uh, Grenfell Tower, like, this, we have a Grenfell community. Um, they are so, they were so, such a big part of the makeup of this neighbourhood. So many uh, people from all over, from North Africa, from uh, sub-Saharan uh, uh, part of the, of, of, of the continent, that continent, uh, from Portugal, from Spain, from Colombia, South America, a uh, lot of um, in, uh, in Indian people, uh, Bangladeshi and so on. So basically it was really a mixed community and um, yeah, and we, you know, uh, I was quite, you know, very happy living in there, 27 years of my life, you know, so it's, it's a big, big chunk of my life. <laughs> Grenfell Tower was built in 1974 and contained 120 flats, housing between 400 and 600 people like a small vertical village. Three finger-like buildings extended from the second floor mezzanine, the ground and first floor being a hallway with a shopping level. The walls were built to withstand a fire for about an hour and to contain any fire internally. Geraldine Denning lives in another tower block in South London and is the lead architect of Architects for Social Housing and has followed the unfolding housing crisis in London for decades. If a fire takes place in one compartment, the compartmentation means that that fire is not allowed to spread to another one. So in a typical tower block like Grenfell Tower, each flat would be a complete compartment and that would be the walls and the floors and the ceilings. Um, so, of course, that relies upon the, uh, the, the, the fire um, protection between compartments. So there's always things which pass through walls and floors. So services, um, doors and windows, things that break the compartment. So those are obviously the key points where you have to ensure that even if the compartmentation, the strategy is adequate and sufficient and perfectly and, and a good strategy, everything, all those other little details also have to support that strategy. The building's original design had fireproofing systems to protect the residents, including a protected central hallway and stairwell equipped with extractor fans and emergency lighting. The central circulation, the central core of Grenfell, uh, has only one stair. Um, that was a traditional and still is uh, current practice um, in the UK. Um, because the fire stair isn't deemed in, in, in a building which, ha which is compartmentalised like that, uh, the, the, the stair isn't, isn't used for, a, for escape, or rather not for emergency evacuation. Um, I think that's a very important thing to consider. Um, so when you, when you have a building which is compartmentalised like this, the, the general rule is to stay put. So the idea is that if you have a fire in your compartment, 
the idea is to retain, is to, is to, is to um, restrain the fire within that compartment. Little more than 30 years after the tower was built, the local council began exploring ways of cashing in on the value of this prized stretch of land between Ladbroke Grove and Latimer Road tube stations. Simon Elmer co-directs the association and is the co-author of the first publicly available report on the Grenfell Tower disaster. In sometime in the early 2000s, um, the Lancaster West Estate, which is what Grenfell Tower sits on, and the neighbouring estate, the Silchester Estate, and some of the other area around it, there was a kind of an entire area plan, was put up for regeneration. It's a poor area of Kensington, Chelsea, which is one of the richest boroughs probably the richest borough in, uh, in the UK. They did this in the middle of the financial crash, um, and in which, in 2007, after that, um, house prices in London fell for the first time since, you know, kind of like the late 70s or something. So they came up with a revised plan. This is the council, Kensington Chelsea Council, which was to demolish the Silchester estate still, um, but to refurbish the Lancaster West estate including Grenfell Tower. A few years before Grenfell, an area in this neighbourhood was um, earmarked, chosen for regeneration. Uh, but in local authority language, regeneration means knocking down buildings. It means uh, us losing our homes. It doesn't mean reviving the area. If they were going to start building um, new developments, new properties around there, residential properties, for anything between four in that area, certainly over a million quid, maybe £750,000. Um, people are not going to pay for those properties when they're looking across at a post-war 70s concrete council estate. Michael Jardine is a local activist and architect who lives on the Silchester estate and opposed the controversial Notting Barnes master plan. The Notting Barnes master plan was a regeneration of both estates on a loose uh, principle that, you know, they were at the end of their life or were perceived to have antisocial behaviour or that the council fundamentally didn't like them and didn't see why they had to pay to maintain them when the brand of Kensington and Chelsea could be projected into this area. One of the most hotly contested issues was the construction of a privately owned sixth form academy. In front of the Grenfell Tower, that is as part of the Lancaster West Estate, there was a large car park and a series of gardens which were used by the local residents. The principle of building high tower blocks in the 70s was to actually free up the land around it for recreational use and all sorts of other ideas. What the council came to a decision was to sell that land for the building of a private academy school. Um, the idea behind this, which is used on almost every council estate regeneration scheme, is what's called cross-subsidization. You privatize part of the land, or you use council land to build market sale developments on it, uh, residences, and then you use the profits from that to subsidise the building of whatever, council housing, affordable housing, or to refurbish council estates that you're not going to demolish. We used to have um, three um, uh, football pitches and then a massive uh, uh, car park. And then on the side you would have also a road that would go uh, right next to the tower. Okay, which makes sense. You know, you have access to the tower in case of. They said, okay, we're going to use the space because we need to build an academy in there. We need to build a school, but we're going to refurbish the tower. The tower now is standing right in a cul-de-sac, having access only from a small road, which is called Grenfell Road, with cars parked on each side. And they said, we are trapped in here. Aesthetically, I think the cladding was originally specified by the architects of the academy to make a whole piece of the academy and the, and the tower. 
In 2012, the local council put the tower block refurbishment to tender and eventually opted for a low-cost cladding proposal aimed at improving heat efficiency and beautifying the concrete high-rise. When you understand the way that a, a, a building, a fire system works, it's not just the individual materials, but it's also the way they work um, together. Um, so what we had, what we most likely understand was that there was a piece of some kind of timber, whether it's an oriented OSB board or a ply board that was installed on the surface of the, the concrete. Onto that you'd have your insulation um, and onto that was the, the, the aluminium uh, support for the cladding and then the cladding itself. And it was the, it was the, it was the, the way in, work in which all those different pieces of the structure work together, which is what created the, the, the inferno. They filled up the gaps between the, the concrete and this um, uh, uh, sheet of uh, aluminium, whatever it was, that was totally flammable. And inside they put some insulation material, yeah? But also in there, they put a lot of rubbish. Rubbish that came from the buildings. Instead of taking it down, they would, you know, stuff it in there. We, you know, it's like putting dust under the carpet. Nobody will see it. Given the, the, the complaints that were coming from the residents at every stage, of the construction um, and the refurbishment of the building, the complaints of the, san the standard of the installation. Um, I mean, there's nothing left of the tower now to know, but in terms of the, the, it's highly likely that the standard of installation of some of these things means that a lot of the fire collars, for example, may not have been installed correctly. Um, a lot of the intumescent strips, a lot of the, uh, the, the fire protection uh, strategies may well have not been installed adequately correctly. That's highly likely, given what the residents had already said. Starting in 2012, Grenfell Tower was refurbished with a new external insulation and overcladding system, new windows and window frames with extractor fans. Refurbishment was completed in 2016 at a cost of £8.6 million, two and a half million less than the original budget. Poor maintenance and non-compliance of some of the refurbishment materials turned a small fire into a catastrophe. The cladding itself, called Celotex, consisted of sheets of polysocyanurate glued to a plywood backing attached to the outer concrete surface of the building. This surface was protected by a Rainobond rain shield made of a sandwich of 6 mm of polyethylene between two half mm thick aluminium sheets. The original KCTMO project promised zinc outer panels with a higher fire resistance. Expert witnesses testified that cladding panels did not comply with the more rigorous standards for insulating materials on high-rise dwellings. Rather, they only complied with less rigorous specifications for outer surface building materials, even though these panels contained a highly flammable polyethylene core. According to expert reports, the hasty assembly of the cladding also left exposed polyethylene edges and removed fire-stopping mechanisms, especially along the columns running up the building. However, these were not the only factors that killed 72 people that night. Over and beyond the disastrous rain cladding, there were also weatherproofing rubber membranes, spray foam, PVC windows, silicone sealant, glues, and polystyrene window fill panels. All of these highly combustible materials were interconnected by air-filled cavities that allowed the fire to race up, down, and horizontally across the exterior of Grenfell Tower. The cladding would have added a good 20 or 30 centimetres, 20 or 25 centimetres to the surface of the building. That's to include 150 millimetres of insulation. So you suddenly have this space within this cavity and the insulation itself, which can then pass up through the window frames, essentially, into the interior of the building. And so that becomes a very, very fragile part in the, in the, in the building envelope. The fact is that the window should have been totally, um, totally sealed off airtight. 
windows and, and ledges and, and, and frames, whatever you want to call them, and they were not. And that's what caused the smoke, that's what was, you know, it, it, you know when you see smoke coming in and, uh, and, and it doesn't go out and, you know, what do you do, you know, so it's the smoke that kills, it's not the fire itself. And I've got the picture in there of the little puffs of smoke coming in. There should be fire stopping measures which would go around all the openings and at various stages on each floor essentially which would prevent exactly what we saw happening. So it leads us to conclude that those fire stopping measures weren't in place. By 1.30 a.m. the fire was out of control but dispatchers continued to tell residents to stay put. Ten residents died trying to go down the stairs. Many were discouraged by the smoke and went upwards, but there was no way onto the roof. I could see people waving, uh, people calling for help, children screaming. Um, I saw a woman at a window and she just burst into flames. Uh, it's just like a gush of fire. Uh, we felt their pain. And I think, I don't know how to explain that, but we knew they were going to die. And there's nothing we could do. Uh, they were trapped, it was an inferno. Families with children could be seen waving from their apartments or flashing the lights on and off. At least four victims died after having jumped from their burning apartments. The fire brigade was forced by smoke and heat in the only central stairwell to move its command post to the bottom of the building. Rescue teams were sent to save people trapped in their apartments. The lifts did not comply with fire safety rules and were unavailable for firefighters to use. Some of the apartments had also been renumbered and some had no numbers on their doors at all. In other cases, the stranded victims had moved to their neighbours or further up the building to the very top, where firefighters had trouble reaching them. At 2.35 a.m., the fire brigade told dispatchers that stay put was no longer an option and residents should try to get out if possible. It was too late. 114 were still inside. Only 42 made it out alive. The second time that I tried to get out to, you know, to try to see if I could go down, if the smoke in the hallway would be a bit, uh, um, a bit better, uh, a bit clearer, it was even worse. And what put me off as well was the second time when I tried to get out was that um, uh, noises was coming. I could hear some noises and people screaming. So it was really discouraging, you know, to, to try to go out and to do something stupid. By 3 a.m., the fire in the Grenfell Tower had spread up the vertical columns, then horizontally around the crown, and then back down in other directions. And then, like a macabre Christmas tree, spread sideways into the apartments, one by one. These incredible infrared images from the Metropolitan Police helicopter show how the flames spread around the building. The flames spread relentlessly through air cavities, fueled by the polyethylene sandwich, melting the plastics, polycyanurate panels and aluminium debris, eventually setting the panels on fire. An unbearable stench filled the area. Uh, and there were gas explosions and it felt like the tower was moving sideways and we were quite terrified that it would collapse. We were pretty much on our own. I think we felt uh, really unsafe. There were um, uh, burning debris coming to our courtyards. Uh, it was terrible. I could, um, at some point, I needed to go through the police cordon and the police officer told me, you can go, but it's at your own peril. Mm -hmm. And I went and I saw my neighbours in shock, sheer shock. Daniela Fetkansu is a preacher of the nearby Notting Hill Methodist Church where much of the community assembled during the fire. You could hear the most horrific screams and it got to a stage anyway where we were told we had to leave because of the debris that was coming from the, the buildings. It was 
don't know what they were, but they could harm us and, and the fumes and that sort of thing. And the community, the people, the shock on their faces. The rescue efforts were tireless, but slow and ineffective. Body cam footage worn by a fire chief recorded him begging for an accurate set of floor plans from the KCTMO. As far as I'm aware, the, the guy from the TMO, the MD from the TMO, has got plans on his um, phone, and he was looking to bring them through to somebody. So, for what it's got, worth, I've got a picture. Of, I've got a picture from the BA from BA in control of the layout of a, of a standard floor. But also, we've got we know which really number send, the flats sending are. Sending it on a phone is no good for me. So, if, and I, I hate to say this, and please don't record this in the minutes, but having experienced the back end of the Lackenau inquiry. Having been in charge of other major incidents, I'm telling you now that the, the fact you have not been able to get me a set of plans, actually as a set of plans, is a major deficiency. At 5, 5.30, just before, the, the, before my last conversation with Christopher, I saw the fire crawling down on the cladding on the outside of my son's window. So I saw, the, and when I saw the fire, I said, you know, bloody hell, now the fire is, you know, uh, you know, that's when, you know, I got a bit, you know, a bit more nervous. And, but um, the fact is that then the firefighters from the high ladder, they, f they, they spray a lot of water and then water, uh, they put off the fire and they spray a lot of water into my, my and Christopher's bedroom as well. Through only the, li the windows were closed, but there was a little vent at the top that was open. And through that vent, a lot of water, a lot of water came through. But I was happy to see the water. More had gone wrong than anyone would have imagined. If that fire hadn't started, none of this would have happened. Um, the next thing went wrong um, was that as soon as the, the fire was able to get outside of the building, um, there's, there's a debate as to whether or not the, the construction of the windows, so the refurbishment of the windows, the new position of the windows was outside of the, the, the original frame of the building. The reality was it was a very hot night um, and the chances were everybody's windows would have been open at that point. The new material which was placed onto the building did transmit uh, uh, the flame across its surface. One of the key um, mechanisms for that spread of flame was um, what could be understood as a series of chimneys. There were uh, gaps which uh, moved up through the building to enable the, the draft of air to pull the flames vertically up, um, up the building. The cladding system on Grenfell was such that once, that once it had caught fire, that building was going to go up, I think, like a tinderbox. But that didn't mean that the people in it had to die. The residents had been complaining about the poor quality of the renovation of the interior which involved lots of fire safety measures, the securing of the compartmentalization of it, um, the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the smoke extractors didn't work, the fact that the emergency lighting in the stairwell didn't work, the fact that, as they reported, gas mains unboxed ran down the fire stairway, which is kind of, a, kind of, a, kind of the extent of the lunacy of the refurbishment of that. Antonio Roncolato was still alive. Around 5.30, 6 o'clock, um, I had the last conversation with Christopher and I said, Christopher, listen, I've been here for so, so long. They told me that they would come and get me. They told me to stay put, even though I cannot go out. And, um, and I said, I need you to, you know, I need to, to speak to someone to see really what's happening. Mm -hmm. And he, he ran right next to the tower and then he passed, you know, one fire, one fire marshal or, or fire brigade man or something. And so I said, look, this is, this is happening. I'm still here. You told me to stay put. And I, I tried twice to go out and the, the smoke is horrible. So then this guy told me, it was around six o'clock, he told me, um, okay, mate, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, literally like that, wait a second, wait a second. So then I could hear that he was talking to someone else. He talked to two firemen. And then he said, okay, be prepared because somebody is coming to you now. Others were talking to people trapped on the inside. Several broadcast on Facebook Live and used other social media to communicate their last desperate feelings to the world. The thoughts of those who survived went to those still trapped. At last, Antonio Roncolato was able to escape. I got ready and then a few minutes after, six o'clock, two firefighters came in to my flat. They knocked 
they banged at the door. I opened them straight away and they, saw, they told me, how many of you? I said, there's only me. Right, um, we're going to do the following. I'm going to be in the front. You are uh, going to be in the middle, behind me. You grab me on, from my jacket at the back and my colleague is going to be in the back of you and he will, he will um, guide you through as well. So, um, uh, and I said, are you ready? I said, uh, yes. He took my hat off <laughs> and he put a wet towel that he found on the floor. He put it over me. I had uh, a wet towel, small wet towel on my, on my, on my mouth, so to, to, you know, to protect my breathing basically. And on the way down, uh, I stepped over a dead body and I couldn't move any further down. So the guy behind me, uh, he lifted my feet, my foot, my right foot, and he freed me and then we moved on. By failing to properly assess fire danger in the refurbished, cladded Grenfell Tower, London had failed its most vulnerable citizens, many of whom were foreigners or of non-British descent. Entire families died in the Grenfell Tower fire, huddled together in their flats or fleeing down the stairwell. The nation mourned 72 dead from all over the world. Antonio Roncolato survived. I was the one, like, don't worry, I'm here, you know, I'm fine, you know, everything is okay, I got out, you know. But um, it was um, extremely, extremely stressful, and mainly for Christopher, because Christopher was outside the tower, watching the beast burning and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Me inside, and even though I was trying to, because I had to reassure him, that I was okay, that this is not my day, that I will make it, that everything's gonna be fine, that we're gonna be together again. But he was not sure. In 2009, rain cladding on another council building, Lackanall House in southern London, caught fire. Six people died. After the Lackanall House fire in 2009, um, the coroner took about three years to write this report and it made a series of recommendations. Um, one of the key ones was that the, the, not the cause of the fire, but the virulence of the fire, how a small fire managed to kill six people and spread up so quickly, was that it used um, aluminium composite rain cladding. And this is the form that's used on the, similar form to used on the Grenfell Tower fire. If sprinklers had been installed, the fire would not have spread to the outer flammable surface of the building. But sprinkler systems are not required by law to be retrofitted onto older buildings in Britain. The all-party parliamentary fire safety and rescue group, which is composed of, I guess, the most senior fire experts in the, in the, in the country, sent um, uh, letters urging uh, four subsequent ministers, two ministers and two under-ministers, in the Department of um, Communities and Local Government to pass legislation for the retrofitting of sprinklers to residential dwellings. And this urging was sat on by subsequent ministers over a very long time. The type of cladding used in the Grenfell Tower is banned in Germany and in the USA on high-rise buildings above 18 meters. Building regulations in Britain require external surfaces do not spread fire but do not take into account the possibility of fire spreading via exposed flammable edges. After a similar fire in Australia, a senior fire safety engineer testified that one kilo of polyethylene is equivalent to five and a half litres of petrol. What was produced was a kind of cocktail. Um, within that panel, there are there were uh, there's the, it's possible to add certain additives which might have sort of mineralized that, which I think potentially would have reduced the fire um, the flammability of that material. Um, as far as I'm aware, they didn't use those 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 panels. Um, um, but yeah, I mean the speed at which it went up the building, I'd say yes, pretty much was petrol. If you'd seen the the flames and the, the footage filmed from all those people's mobile phone cameras, then yeah, that was like igniting petrol on a building, yeah. London is one of the richest cities in the world, and land is extremely valuable. 
The local boroughs stand to make a fortune from selling the land to developers who promise that a certain number of social homes will be retained. This rarely happens. About, hmm, about 20 years ago, probably a little bit longer, um, there was what we're in the middle of now, or 20 odd years into, which is a national program called the Estate Regeneration Program. In London, it almost always means, uh, regeneration always means demolition and redevelopment. Um, that's because the Estate Regeneration Program in its current form is not about refurbishing homes, but of getting access to the land that these council estates uh, are built on. Many Grenfell residents are still without permanent housing. They are eager to see justice done and the truth about what went wrong that night come out in the ongoing inquiry. They have publicly defended members of the fire brigades, who some see as scapegoats for a much bigger problem. Local MP Emma Dent Code joined a march in support of the men and women who risked their lives battling the Grenfell Tower fire. There's been no change at the council. Um, this could happen again tomorrow. If this has happened to their neighbours, they, they would have dealt with it. And I genuinely think there's a really horrible and unforgivable undercurrent of racism there. They may not even be aware of it themselves, but they do think that people in the tower are lesser beings, and I've seen that many, many times. I'm on the Fire Safety and Rescue Committee um, at, um, in, the, uh, in Parliament, and we're constantly making recommendations. We have the Fire Minister in, ask him questions. He doesn't know, he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's very offhand about it. It's really, it, this could happen again tomorrow. As the flames were eating through the Grenfell Tower, this multi-ethnic community came together. In what was a makeshift emergency shelter under the overpass, survivors have since posted their personal stories, memories and calls for justice. Children put up drawings of the night. People of different faiths came together to help their fellow neighbours. I remember there are lots of people crying, saying, I can't find my cousin, I can't find my daughter, I can't find this. And it got to a situation where we say, what do they look like? Photographs and that sort of thing. We had the Notting Hill van outside and they started putting pictures of, uh, you know, the missing people on there. And that sort of like grew really, you know, and then it was on the railings and then it was on the walls and then it was just all around the community. Um, because um, people were just saying, have you seen this person? Have you? Because people were obviously running to all sorts of areas and, being to, and, and some people were not actually in at the time. You know, so uh, there were lots of people who were looking for, for their family members. The anger that still simmers under the ashes of the gutted Grenfell Tower is fueling a new civic movement of solidarity and self-governance that may one day be the cornerstone of a new community. I think what the, the tragedy did, it highlighted that um, stigma. I would call it stigma because it's not just race or faith, it's social status somehow. It's like living, living in social housing is a bad thing, um, that we can't be uh, educated people or we don't have a career. And when you look at the makeup of the local area, uh, people are working, people are, you know, have degrees. And it's like no matter what we do in our life, no matter how high we reach in our life, we're still um, labelled as uh, low-class people. More than two years after 72 people died in the Grenfell Tower fire, the inquiry has yet to determine officially what went wrong. But resilient residents have Grenfell in their hearts and are not about to let the country forget. Any local authority would have lost its right to make decisions for people it serves. But this local authority continued to do so while it was still under um, a question mark as to its fitness to um, exercise their duty of care. They are on the criminal investigation for potential breaches of health and safety regulations. 
Why should we trust them? Why should we go to them? Uh, so it created a, a, a vacuum. And that vacuum was filled by the community. Hence, we set up the space here. Because either you bring government to take over, or you bring commissioners to take over, or the community to take over. The Lancaster Estate residents plan to keep pushing for justice, calling for public and private sector accountability and lobbying for policy changes that will help prevent any such tragedy from happening again. Only if the lessons of the Grenfell Tower fire are learned and real changes arise from the inquiry will the deaths of their friends, family and neighbours not have been in vain.